Senator, what's off the sidelines? Off the sidelines is a call to action to ask women to get involved in politics. It's a call to candidates to run, like Jennifer. She's off the sidelines. She's running for Congress. It's also a call to action for women everywhere to vote, uh, to be heard, to elevate their voices, and make sure that they're being represented here in Washington. Do women need to be urged to run or to vote? They do. And uh, interesting, though, in this moment of time we're in right now, they really don't need to be urged. They're running because they're so furious at what President Trump's doing. They disagree with the direction he's taking this country, and they're fighting back. And they are running, and they are running in large numbers all across the country. Uh, almost 200 women are running for Congress right now as nominees. And so it's exciting. Uh, women really do want to be heard. They want to be represented, and they want to change the direction the country's going in. Why, you're the junior senator from New York, why did you endorse Jennifer Wexton here in Virginia? Because she's making a difference. Uh, she believes that health care is a right and not a privilege. Uh, she's going to fight really hard so families can earn their way into the middle class. And we share the same values. And I believe that she's going to win because she wants to make a difference and she wants to come to Washington to get things done. Her whole uh, work life has shown that she brings people together on a bipartisan basis and gets things done. And that's the one thing we desperately need in Washington. And we've seen that from women over time, that they're very good at finding common ground, listening, building consensus, and then passing legislation to help people. And I think Jennifer wants to be in Congress because she wants to help people. So you're building an ally here for what you expect to happen in November? I hope so, yeah. And I think women everywhere, um, we tend to work together, uh, even across party lines. Anytime I've ever passed a bill, whether it was the 9-11 health, health bill or don't ask, don't tell repeal, it was strong women helping me, both Democrat and Republican. So I think when Jennifer gets to Washington, she's going to find allies, she's going to build consensus, and she's going to pass bills. So what is a win for Get Off the Sidelines? electing more women. And someday we want to get 51% of women in Congress. We actually want to represent the population of America and show the diversity of America because when we have more women at the table, I promise you, they're going to raise different issues, they're going to offer different solutions, and we're going to get more things done. In some ways, you could look at the races right now and say we're, we're making progress. I mean, we have broken the record now for the number of successful women uh, winning and running nominations, uh, gubernatorial races, the House, the Senate. Those are at the primaries. Can you maintain that momentum going into the midterm races? I absolutely believe we will. How? Well, you saw it from the Women's March. You saw millions of people march around the country to be heard, carrying signs, all issues, because they believe that this president, President Trump, is taking this country in the wrong direction. He's harming our families. He's done everything he can to undermine people's right to health care. Uh, he, he's doing everything he can to uh, make it harder for our middle class families to make ends meet and to provide for their kids. Uh, he's not taking on the drug companies. He's not taking on big business. Uh, he's lined the swamp with swamp creatures. He's doing everything he said he wasn't going to do. And this culture of corruption continues to grow under the Trump administration. And what people want, certainly in my state, and what I've heard from even your supporters here today, is they want oversight and accountability over President Trump. And they want to help people um, with the things they need to provide for their kids, basic basic things like opportunities to train for a good job, basic health care as a right, not a privilege, um, making sure that uh, they have a job if they want a job. These are really core bread and butter issues. So you draw a direct line between President Trump's election and the number of women running now? Absolutely. Based on j not demographic shifts, but just pure protest? Protest, anger, frustration, and determination to protect their families. Um, I just met Danica Rome. You know, she ran against the guy who wrote the tra tra transgender bathroom bill. She's a transgender woman. These women are saying, I am going to represent my values, my family, my community, and I'm going to make a difference and put this country back on the right track. What is it like running as a first-time candidate in this particular cycle? Well, I'm not a first-time candidate. I'm a sitting state senator here in Virginia 10. Well, at, this, at this level of race, what is it like jumping in? It's exciting and it's wonderful. Uh, what we've been seeing on the ground is amazing. And we had, we had a test case here in Virginia last year because we had races for the House of Delegates in our statewides. And we flipped 15, 15 seats from red to blue in Virginia, and 11 of those were, for, were new, newly elected Democratic women. So we've already seen the energy on the ground, uh, and it has not gone anywhere. Everybody is really excited about this race. 
and speaking of energy, I mean, you're running in a district that's been held by Republicans since the 80s. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing in terms of your pull ahead in the polls, what do you attribute that to? I attribute it to my my background. You know, I'm I'm a mom of kids in in the school system. I'm a former prosecutor from the heart of the district in Loudoun County, and I'm a state senator who, during my tenure in the in the Senate, has passed over 40 bills, every single one with bipartisan support, because I focus on issues that help kids and families, and that's what people care about. When I asked you that question, the first thing you said is you were a mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you credit that as an asset? because so many of the, my constituents are moms and we're all, I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing this because I wanna make sure that we create the best possible country and world that we can for them. And under the current administration, under Don, Donald Trump's presidency, I'm worried about how much damage can be done to our country in the next couple of years. Do you think that something has changed where, you know, in the past people wanted to almost play down their gender to say, don't be distracted by that? I'm just like a guy. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel comfortable saying, I'm a mom and that's a good thing? Because we bring great things to the table. As women, we are uh, able to check our egos at the door and work together to get things done and deliver results. Uh, as moms, we are able to prioritize and multitask all the many things that, that help us as legislators. And we're able to empathize and understand the issues that our constituents are facing. Do you think, though, that in this particular race, it's kind of unusual. I mean, you're a woman running against another woman here, Barbara Comstock. Does that change the dynamic of the race at all? Maybe a little bit, because we are both women, so we can't put it in that frame of a man versus a woman. Um, but when you have a woman who is not voting in a way that helps other women, uh, it's time to replace her. You know, Barbara Comstock ha opposes equal pay for equal work. She has repeatedly voted to strip uh, women and families from much needed health care. And when someone is voting that way, it's time to replace them. Mm -hmm. Does it make it harder to campaign against a woman? You know, I run my campaign as, as myself, not as a woman running against a woman or a woman running against a man. You know, I focus on my background and the many things I've accomplished and the things I want to do. What advice has the senator given you in this race? To sh Senator Gillibrand has been very helpful and, and has advised me about just being myself and talking about the issues that, that motivate me and move me uh, because people value somebody who's going to be genuine and is going to do what they say and say what they do. You know, there's a number, a record number of women running against other women, uh, in, in addition to just being, you know, out there in the first place and, and putting themselves uh, on the line on the ballot. Senator, you draw this as a direct line back to President mm -hmm. Trump. Would you also attribute it to President Trump? I think tr Donald Trump has a lot to do with it. I think a lot of women uh, woke up uh, after the November election in 2016 and realized that uh, democracy is a lot more fragile than any of us wanted to admit and that the only way we were going to change things would be to get off the sidelines and run ourselves. Yeah. Why do you think there are three times as many Democratic women in Congress as Republicans? Why do you think there's a partisan divide here? Well, um, in answer to the question you just asked her, the fact that Donald Trump has been accused by more than a dozen women of sexual assault and sexual harassment alone uh, has infuriated women enough to do something that they might otherwise have not done, taken the risk to actually run for office. In the past, they might have done public service through charitable work, through community service, but they're really saying, no, no, I'm going to run because the issues that I care about aren't being addressed. Um, this president's not being held accountable. The policies that he's putting forward are harmful to women and families. He doesn't value women. But all those things came to light or were accused, uh, he was accused of these things when he was running as candidate. He Correct. was elected regardless. Fair enough. But the response to him being elected, I think, is this overwhelmingly desi overwhelming desire of women to be heard, to be counted, um, and to fight back against what he stands for. 
and what he's said. Uh, he demeans women, he devalues women uh, over and over again, and he really has harmed our families in very serious ways, whether he's trying to take away our access to health care or siding with insurers who want to charge us more money for pre-existing conditions or taking away the mandate just to gut it entirely. He's constantly trying to harm our families and our communities. And so women, when they know their family's being harmed, they will run through fire. They will do whatever it takes to protect their family and their communities and their values. And that's why I think you're seeing such extreme response. And I think for Democratic women specifically, to your second question, I think they see what President Trump is so outside the norm and so contrary to their values. I mean, he's attacking transgender troops. He's attacking uh, DACA kids, kids who are protected by DACA, and, and does not support the DREAM Act. He's attacking um, every marginalized group. He's, he uses racial epithets. He uses derogatory statements against all sorts of minority populations. Um, he started out his presidency with a Muslim ban in a country that believes in freedom of religion. So he, he's had an all-out assault on core democratic values, which is why I think so many democratic women, like Jennifer, has said, I'm going to run for this congressional seat because I'm going to provide the oversight and accountability over this administration. I'm going to make sure our families and communities are protected. And yet President Trump has endorsed nine, at least nine, female candidates for these midterm races. So he would argue, as with the White House, he's not anti-women. Mm -hmm. He's actually endorsed your opponent just read, back in New York. I would just read his Twitter feed on any given day, and you'll see he does not support women. He endorsed your, the woman running against you, the Republican female candidate running against you in New York. Yes, and she shares his values. Uh, she wants to take away health care, and she doesn't support women's reproductive choices, and you know she doesn't share my values, and she doesn't share New York's values, so that's not surprising. The president made that personal in a rally this week up in your home state of New York and uh, when he endorsed the woman running the candidate running against you he also slammed you you've been very tough on him but he was tough on you and said that you basically had no accomplishments he hit you for coming and asking and seeking campaign contributions in the past how do you I, respond I think it was a very weak attack and frankly I was surprised it was the best he could do um, but President Trump does not have a relationship with the facts and as a New Yorker, he certainly should know that I've passed the 9-11 health bill twice to give health care to our first responders and the families that live in the community. As the Commander-in-Chief, he should know that I led the charge in repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and because now he's so consumed with trying to ban transgender troops who are serving our country today with distinction honorably. Um, and he also should know, given that his number one lieutenant was just indicted for insider trading, that I wrote and passed uh, the bill to make insider trading for members of Congress illegal, the Stock Act. So if he wants to come campaign against me in New York anytime, he's welcome. Did you hear some of his criticisms, like his hit at you for asking for campaign contributions as gendered? Yes, that was clearly a sexist smear, and it was intended specifically to silence me. Why and, did you hear it that way? And the dozens of women who had just come out against him for sexual assault and sexual harassment, and the millions of women who have been marching against him since he became president, uh, because of what he said. I mean, I'm not going to repeat it, because it was not a very nice thing to say on Twitter. So you were asking for campaign contributions on your knees? Some no, that I would do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, intended to be a sexist smear, intended to devalue, to denigrate me, as he's done to women across the board. He's been so uh, aggressively um, negative and demeaning to women and unbelievably um, vile towards women of color. Well, this week, uh, the president referred to a former senior White House aide as a dog, someone who had worked with him for years. Um, did, what did you hear when he said that phrase, dog? I hear, uh, again, a very sexist smear uh, that's intended to demean her. Um, he has... He's used it in the past He against has men. used racist words also um, over and over again. He is intending to uh, demean and devalue a former staff member, uh, and he's done that to women of color over the many months that he's been president. Um, I can recall many instances where he's 
uh, spoke about women of color uh, as dumb, as low IQ, as low life. Uh, it really is outrageous how he's attacked NFL players who are just using their constitutional right to free speech. Uh, he has denigrated uh, people of color constantly. Uh, he called uh, Mexicans rapist. I mean, I, I, the list just goes on. He is someone who um, does not value women. He doesn't value women of color, and he is racist. And yet, as we say, he's endorsing female candidates in this race. His successful campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, who's an advisor now, says that it's absurd to accuse him of being in any way sexist um, and actually says that she's being treated in a sexist way because she's a Republican and that her contributions aren't recognized by fellow women. I think she's wrong. And he can support women candidates who also don't share our values. Women are not a monolith. To assume they are is equally absurd. We know that there's been, what, $250,000 that you have helped to raise for 40 candidates nationwide. For you, was fundraising something that you weighed before you decided to run? Was that a worry that you had? Absolutely. Um, you know, asking strangers for money is probably the hardest thing that we do as candidates. Uh, but it's important and you need to do it. And, uh, you know, I did it in my Senate races, so doing it here is, is no different. But what has been really inspiring and wonderful to me is how many grassroots supporters have, have donated from across the country, um, you know, even small dollar donations that add up over time and really help, uh, help in terms of how much money we can raise and our ability to get our, our message out. Do you think that women voters hear campaign slogans or hear your message differently than men? I mean, do you communicate in a different way? I just communicate the way I communicate. You know, my, my, my message is the same for, for a woman as it would be for a man because these are the things I believe and this is what I stand for. Um, what has changed for me is not necessarily the message so much as the many messengers that I have uh, now in, in the era of women being newly awakened and involved in politics because in addition to all the women who are running, there are thousands of women across the country who are getting active politically in volunteering, in coming and knocking doors. I mean, we saw a lot of them here today, mm -hmm. uh, knocking doors, making phone calls, uh, starting groups, uh, and, and talking to their neighbors. And that makes a big difference in terms of the grassroots advocacy and women's empowerment. And when it comes to policy, though, Senator, I mean, there are more women in Congress now than there have been before. You'd mm -hmm. say, still not enough. Mm -hmm. But why can't you get a bill that would toughen sexual harassment policies on Capitol Hill? I agree. I agree. If we had 51 percent of women in the Senate, it would have been done a long, long time ago, uh, along with passing a paid leave plan, along with equal pay, along with making sure women have access to contraception, and a hundred other things. But that being said, it's outrageous that we have not had a vote, and I don't know why we haven't had a vote. It's already passed our ha the Senate unanimously. Right. A similar version passed the House unanimously. There's no reason why these two bills shouldn't be conferenced right now and a final bill be voted on. It's outrageous. Why haven't you seen the movement? I, I don't know, but I'm going to find out, and I'm going to push it because we are still in session, and I want to get that bill passed. And so. It's outrageous. Right now, the law today, if you have a sexual harassment claim against your boss, you might have to wait three months even to file it, to have a month of uh, mandatory um, counseling, a month of mandatory mediation, followed by a month of mandatory cooling off, and then you're allowed to file your claim. And then, if your boss was your harasser as a member of Congress, the taxpayer is the one who pays the settlement. And so our bill changes that. It says if the member of Congress is the one who is the harasser, he or she has to pay the settlement. And it says that um, you don't have to wait three months. You can just file a claim right away. And then if you want to be public about it, that's your right. You don't have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So it's outrageous. And these rules should be fixed now. You know, something that's often been characterized as a woman's issue in the past has really become a bipartisan one, and you had Senator Marco Rubio coming forward with a paid family leave act proposal backed by the White House. So now you have uh, a male senator spearheading this mm -hmm. and the backing of the White House. Will you sign on to his bill? Well, his bill is harmful to women uh, in many ways. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful that talking about paid leave is now a bipartisan issue, but what they've offered is a fake paid leave plan because it makes you take your Social Security money and use it up 
to do paid leave. And so for a lot of women who might take that paid leave, they tend to live longer anyway. So they're just going to have to work longer and pay into Social Security longer just to be able to retire. So it's the wrong approach. I and think you want to raise payroll taxes versus much drawing prefer, from Social Security. I much prefer for every worker to put $2 a week into an account for themselves and have their employer match it. It's not a lot of money. $2 a week is something everyone can afford. And what that would give all working Americans is a paid leave plan regardless of where they work. They can work in a big company, a small company, part-time, full-time, big city, uh, rural area, gig economy, you're all covered. And that's why having an earned benefit like Social Security where it can be portable is the way to go. And so I'm just going to keep fighting for very common sense paid leave, which is very similar to paid leaves that have been passed in large states like New York, like California. Um, and you need it because small states, they couldn't afford it. They don't have enough people to buy into a state paid leave plan. So it needs to be national and I'm going to keep fighting for it. You said women can be more bipartisan. Are you going to work with Senator Rubio to find a compromise? Uh, of course. I've offered to work with him many times already. No taker yet on He's that one? He's not ready. He's interested in his own version, but um, that bill won't get us very far because asking women to draw down on their Social Security is not fair. Do you think that we're going to see more female candidates run in 2020? I certainly hope so. Does 2018 get replicated, or is, is what happens in November going to decide who we see run against President Trump? I think what happens in November is going to decide what our country looks like, because the policies that President Trump is putting forward are so hateful, are so divisive, are so harmful to our middle class, hardworking families. And so I think this election is a referendum on President Trump on the fact that he doesn't represent uh, most Americans, that his values don't line up with most Americans. And so being heard in this election sets the stage for everything in the future. And so most of us are very focused on electing Jennifer and candidates exactly like her around the country who are fighting for the right things because they believe it and they are fighting from their hearts and fighting with passion and fighting with integrity and going to make a difference when you get there. Do you see it as a test case for 2020 that there could be again the Democratic candidate, a woman? I think you'll have many women run in 2020. I think you'll have a lot of diversity. Will you run? Running. No, I'm running for Senate, and I'm running for re-election in my state in November, too. And I'm running against a woman, too, which is a yes. good thing. That is a good thing to have more women running, Democrat and Republican. And if you win that re-election, you're not precluding running in 2020 for president? I'm solely focused on 18, and I think all of us are. All right, we'll come back to you after, uh, after <laughs> November. Um, Ms. Wexton, I, I want to ask you, looking at some of the issues that you've been talking about mm -hmm. here in Virginia, this is a state that's going through a lot of changes in terms of patterns of voting. MS-13 specifically um, has come up again and again uh, at the presidential level. It's come up in your race as well against Barbara Comstock. You've accused her of fear-mongering and race-baiting. What do you think here is really driving uh, the concern about this particular gang, and why did you level that accusation against her? We've seen the Republican playbook before. You know, this is what they did in 2017 in our gubernatorial race, and I have little doubt that they're going to try to trot that playbook out again. Um, Republicans don't want to talk about the fact that they don't have the political will or courage to pass comprehensive immigration reform or even look at ways to, uh, to reform our broken Im immigration system short of kicking people out of the country or, or slamming the doors on people who would come to this country. So they, they're trying to conflate uh, MS-13 with immigration. And people, this is a very diverse district, you know, we have a lot of new and aspiring Americans here, and they, they saw right through it in 2017, and I would imagine they will in 2018 as well. The Senator's been very vocal about calling for the abolishment of ICE, or at least an overhaul of it. Do you agree with her position? That's one position that I do not agree with. Um, no, I do not support abolishing ICE. Uh, I think that we need comprehensive immigration reform, uh, but ICE does good things like, you know, a lot of the human trafficking investigations uh, come through ICE, and so that's one area that we don't agree on. Okay. And if the senator decides to run, are you going to do her a few favors if you win in November, be out there on the campaign trail for her? I hope she runs. <laughs> um, I can tell you one thing, she'll be about a thousand times better than the current occupant of the White House. <laughs>